Chapter 23 Out 1. Derry, 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock a.m. By 10 past 9, Derry wind speeds were being clocked at an average of 55 miles an hour, with gusts up to 70. The anemometer in the courthouse registered one gust of 81, and then the needle dropped all the way back to zero. The wind had ripped the whirling cup-like device on the courthouse roof off its moorings, and it flew away into the rain-swept dimness of the day. Like George Dembro's boat, it was never seen again. By 9.30, the thing the Derry Water Department had sworn was now impossible seemed not only possible, but imminent. That downtown Derry might be flooded for the first time since August of 1958, when many of the old drains had clogged up or caved in during a freak rainstorm. By quarter of ten, men with grim faces were arriving in cars and pickup trucks along both sides of the canal, their foul-weather gear rippling crazily in the freight train wind. For the first time since October of 1957, sandbags began to go up along the canal's cement sides. The arch where the canal went under the three-way intersection at the heart of Derry's downtown area was full almost to the top. Main Street, Canal Street, and the foot of Up Mile Hill were impassable except by foot, and those who splashed and hurried their way toward the sandbagging operation felt the very streets beneath their feet trembling with the frenzied flow of the water, the way a turnpike overpass will tremble when big trucks pass each other. But this was a steady vibration, and the men were glad to be on the north side of downtown, away from that steady rumbling that was felt rather than heard. Harold Gardner shouted at Alfred Zittner, who ran Zittner's Realty on the west side of town, asked him if the streets were going to collapse. Zittner said hell would freeze over before something like that happened. Harold had a brief image of Adolf Hitler and Judas Iscariot handing out ice skates and went on heaving sandbags. The water was now less than three inches below the top of the canal cement walls. In the barrens, the Kanduskeeg was already out of its banks, and by noon, the luxuriant undergrowth and scrub trees would be poking out of a vast, shallow, stinking lake. The men continued to work, pausing only when the supply of sandbags ran out. And then, at ten of ten, they were frozen by a great rending, ripping sound. Harold Gardner later told his wife he thought maybe the end of the world had come. It wasn't downtown falling into the earth. Not then. It was the standpipe. Only Andrew Keene, Norbert Keene's grandson, actually saw it happen. And he had smoked so much Colombian red that morning that at first he thought it had to be a hallucination. He had been wandering Derry's storm-swept streets since about eight o'clock, roughly the same time that Dr. Hale was ascending to the great family medical practice in the sky. He was drenched to the skin, except for the two-ounce baggie of pot tucked up into his armpit that was, but totally unaware of it. His eyes widened in disbelief. He had reached Memorial Park, which stood on the flank of Standpipe Hill, and unless he was wrong, the Standpipe now had a pronounced lean like that fucked-up tower in Pisa that was on all the macaroni boxes. Oh, wow, Andrew Keene cried, his eyes widening even more. They looked as if they might be on small, tough springs now, as the splintering sounds began. The standpipe's lean was becoming more and more acute. As he stood there with his jeans plastered to his skinny shanks and his drenched paisley headband dripping water into his eyes. White shingles were popping off the downtown side of the great round water tower. No, not exactly popping off. It was more like they were squirting off. And a definite crinkle had appeared about twenty feet above the standpipe's stone foundation. Water suddenly began to spray out through this crinkle. And now the shingles weren't squirting off the standpipe's downtown side. They were spewing into the wind stream. A rending sound began to come from the standpipe, and Andrew could see it moving like the hand of a great clock inclining from noon to one to two. The baggie of pot fell out of his armpit and fetched up inside his shirt somewhere near his belt. He didn't notice. He was utterly fetched. Large twanging sounds came from inside the standpipe, as if the strings of the world's biggest guitar were being broken one by one. These were the cables inside the cylinder, which had provided the proper balance of stress against the water pressure. The standpipe began to heel over faster and faster, boards and beams ripping apart, splinters jumping and whirling into the air. Far fucking out, Andrew Keene shrieked. 
but was lost in the standpipe's final crashing fall. And, by the rising sound of one and three-quarters million gallons of water, 7,000 tons of water, pouring out of the building's ruptured spouting side. It went in a gray tidal wave, and of course, if Andrew Keene had been on the downhill side of the standpipe, he would have exited the world in no time. But God favors drunks, small children, and the cataclysmically stoned. Andrew was standing in a place where he could see it all and not be touched by a single drop. Great fucking special effects! Andrew screamed as the water rolled over Memorial Park like a solid thing, sweeping away the sundial beside which a small boy named Stan Uris had often stood watching birds with his father's field glasses. Steven Spielberg, eat your heart out! The stone birdbath also went. Andrew saw it for a moment, turning over and over, pedestal for dish and dish for pedestal, and then it was gone. A line of maples and birches separating Memorial Park from Kansas Street were knocked down like so many pins in a bowling alley. They took wild, spiky snarls of power lines with them. The water rolled across the street, beginning to spread now, beginning to look more like water than that mind-boggling solid wall that had taken sundial, birdbath, and trees, but it still had power enough to sweep almost a dozen houses on the far side of Kansas Street off their foundations and into the barrens. They went with sickening ease, most of them still whole. Andrew Keene recognized one of them as belonging to the Carl Massensick family. Mr. Massensick had been his sixth-grade teacher, a real pooch. As the house went over the edge and down the slope, Andrew realized he could still see a candle burning brightly in one window, and he wondered briefly if he might be mentally high-siding it, if you could dig the concept. There was an explosion from the barrens and a brief gout of yellow flame as someone's Coleman gas lantern ignited oil pouring out of a ruptured fuel tank. Andrew stared at the far side of Kansas Street, where until just 40 seconds ago there had been a neat line of middle-class houses. They were gone city now, and you better believe it, sweet thing. In their places were ten cellar holes that looked like swimming pools. Andrew wanted to advance the opinion that this was far fucking out, but he couldn't yell anymore. Seemed like his yeller was busted. His diaphragm felt weak and useless. He heard a series of crunching thuds, the sound of a giant with his shoes full of Ritz crackers marching down a flight of stairs. It was the standpipe rolling down the hill, a huge white cylinder still spouting the last of its water supply, the thick cables that had helped to hold it together flying into the air and then cracking down again like steel bullwhips, digging runnels in the soft earth that immediately filled up with rushing rainwater. As Andrew watched, with his chin resting somewhere between his collarbones, the standpipe, horizontal now, better than 125 feet long, flew out into the air. For a moment, it seemed frozen there. A surreal image straight out of rubber-walled, straight-jacketed Toulouse land. Rainwater sparkling on its shattered sides, its windows broken, casements hanging, the flashing light on top, meant as a warning for low-flying light planes, still flashing. And then it fell into the street with a final rending crash. Kansas Street had channeled a lot of the water and now it began to rush toward downtown by way of Up Mile Hill. There used to be houses over there, Andrew Keene thought, and suddenly all the strength ran out of his legs. He sat down heavily, kersplash. He stared at the broken stone foundation on which the standpipe had stood for his whole life. He wondered if anyone would ever believe him. He wondered if he believed it himself. 2. The Kill, 10.02 a.m., May 31st, 1985. Bill and Richie saw it turn toward them, its mandibles opening and closing, its one good eye glaring down at them, and Bill realized it gave off its own source of illumination like some grisly lightning bug. But the light was flickering and uncertain. It was badly hurt. Its thoughts buzzed and racketed. Let me go! Let me go, and you can have everything you've ever wanted! Money, fame, fortune, power! I can give you these things! In his head. Bill moved forward empty-handed, his eyes fixed on its single red one. 
He felt the power growing inside him, investing him, knotting his arms into cords, filling each clenched fist with its own force. Richie walked beside him, his lips pulled back over his teeth. I can give you your wife back. I can do it, only I... She'll remember nothing as the seven of you remembered nothing. They were close, very close now. Bill could smell its stinking aroma and realized with sudden horror that it was the smell of the barrens, the smell they had taken for the smell of sewers and polluted streams and the burning dump. But had they ever really believed those were all it had been? It was the smell of it, and perhaps it had been strongest in the barrens. But it had hung over all dairy like a cloud, and people just didn't smell it. The way zookeepers don't smell their charges after a while, or even wonder why the visitors wrinkle their noses when they come in. Us two, he muttered to Richie, and Richie nodded without taking his eyes off the spider, which now shrank back from them, its abominable spiny legs clittering, brought to bay at last. I can't give you eternal life, but I can touch you, and you will live long, long lives, 200 years, 300, perhaps 500. I can make you gods of the earth if you let me go, if you let me go, if you let me. Bill, Richie asked hoarsely. With a scream building in him, building up and up and up, Bill charged. Richie ran with him stride for stride. They struck together with their right fists, but Bill understood it was not really their fists they were striking with at all. It was their combined force augmented by the force of that other. It was the force of memory and desire. Above all else, it was the force of love and unforgotten childhood, like one big wheel. The spider's shriek filled Bill's head, seeming to splinter his brains. He felt his fist plunge deep into writhing wetness. His arm followed it in up to the shoulder. He pulled it back, dripping with the spider's black blood. Icor poured from the hole he had made. He saw Richie standing almost beneath its bloated body, covered with its darkly sparkling blood, standing in the classic boxer's stance, his dripping fists pumping. The spider lashed at them with its legs. Bill felt one of them rip down his side, parting his shirt, parting skin. Its stinger pumped uselessly against the floor. Its screams were clarion bells in his head. It lunged clumsily forward, trying to bite him, and instead of retreating, Bill drove forward using not just his fist now, but his whole body making himself into a torpedo. He ran into its gut like a sprinting fullback who lowers his shoulders and simply drives straight ahead. For a moment he felt its stinking flesh simply give, as if it would rebound and send him flying. With an inarticulate scream he drove harder, pushing forward and upward with his legs, digging at it with his hands, and he broke through, was inundated with its hot fluids. They ran across his face, in his ears. He snuffled them up his nose in thin, squirming streams. He was in the black again, up to his shoulders inside its convulsing body, and in his clogged ears he could hear a sound like the steady whack-whack, whack-whack of a big bass drum, the one that leads the parade when the circus comes to town with its complement of freaks and strutting capering clowns. The sound of its heart. He heard Richie scream in sudden pain, a sound that rose into a quick gasping moan and was cut off. Bill suddenly thrust both fisted hands forward. He was choking, strangling in its pulsing bag of guts and waters. Whack, 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 whack. He plunged his hands into it, ripping, tearing, parting, seeking the source of the sound, rupturing organs, his slimed fingers opening and closing, his locked chest seeming to swell from lack of air. Whack, 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 whack. And suddenly, it was in his hands, a great living thing that pumped and pulsed against his palms, pushing them back and forth. No, 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 no! Yes! Bill cried, choking, drowning. Yes, try this, you bitch. Try this one out. Do you like it? Do you love it? Do you? He laced his fingers together over the pulsing narthex of its heart, palms spread apart in an inverted V, and brought them together with all the force he could muster. 
there was one final shriek of pain and fear as its heart exploded between his hands, running out between his fingers in jittering strings. Whack, whack! Whack, whack! The scream fading, dwindling. Bill felt its body clench around him suddenly like a fist in a slick glove. Then everything loosened. He became aware that its body was tilting, slipping slowly off to one side. At the same time, he began pulling back, his consciousness leaving him. The spider collapsed on its side, a huge bundle of steaming alien meat, its legs still quivering and jerking, caressing the sides of the tunnel and scraping across the floor in random scrolls. Bill staggered away, breathing in whooping gasps, spitting in an effort to clear his mouth of its horrible taste. He tripped over his own feet and fell to his knees. And clearly, he heard the voice of the other. The turtle might be dead, but whatever had invested it was not. Son, you did real good. Then it was gone. The power went with it. He felt weak, revulsed, half insane. He looked over his shoulder and saw the dying black nightmare of the spider still jerking and quivering. Richie! He cried out in a hoarse, breaking voice. Richie! Where are you, man? No answer. The light was gone now. It had died with the spider. He fumbled in the pocket of his matted shirt for the last book of matches. They were there, but they wouldn't light. The heads were soaked with blood. Richie! He screamed again, beginning to weep now. He began to crawl forward, first one hand and then the other groping in the dark. At last, one of them struck something which yielded limply to his touch. His hands flew over it and stopped as they touched Richie's face. Richie! Richie! Still no answer. Struggling in the dark, Bill got one arm under Richie's back and the other under his knees. He wobbled to his feet and began to stumble back the way they had come with Richie in his arms. Three. Derry, 10 o'clock to 10.15 a.m. At 10 o'clock, the steady vibration which had been running through Derry's downtown streets increased to a rumbling roar. The Derry News would later write that the supports of the canal's underground portion, weakened by the savage assault of what amounted to a flash flood, simply collapsed. There were, however, people who disagreed with that view. I was there. I know, Harold Gardner later told his wife. It wasn't just that the canal's supports collapsed. It was an earthquake. That's what it was. It was a fucking earthquake. Either way, the results were the same. As the rumbling built steadily up and up, windows began to shatter, plaster ceilings began to fall, and the inhuman cry of twisting beams and foundations swelled into a frightening chorus. Cracks raced up the bullet-pocked brick facade of machins like grasping hands. The cables holding the marquee of the Aladdin Theater out over the street snapped, and the marquee came crashing down. Richard's Alley, which ran behind the Center Street drug, suddenly filled up with an avalanche of yellow brick as the Brian X. Dowd Professional Building, erected in 1952, came crashing down. A huge screen of jaundice-colored dust rose in the air and was snatched away like a veil. At the same time, the statue of Paul Bunyan in front of the city center exploded. It was as if that long-ago art teacher's threat to blow it up had finally proved to be dead serious after all. The bearded, grinning head rose straight up in the air. One leg kicked forward, the other back, as if Paul had attempted some sort of a split so enthusiastic it had resulted in dismemberment. The statue's midsection blew out in a cloud of shrapnel, and the head of the plastic axe rose into the rainy sky, disappeared, and then came down again, twirling end over end. It sheared through the roof of the kissing bridge, and then its floor. And then, at 10.02 a.m., downtown Derry simply collapsed. Most of the water from the ruptured standpipe had crossed Kansas Street and ended up in the Barrens, 
but tons of it rushed down into the business district by way of Up Mile Hill. Perhaps that was the straw that broke the camel's back, or perhaps, as Harold Gardner told his wife, there really was an earthquake. Cracks raced across the surface of Main Street. They were narrow at first, and then they began to gape like hungry mouths, and the sound of the canal floated up, not muffled now, but frighteningly loud. Everything began to shake. The neon sign proclaiming Outlet Moccasins in front of Shorty Squire's souvenir shop hit the street and shorted out in three feet of water. A moment or two later, Shorty's building, which stood next to Mr. Paperback, began to descend. Buddy Angstrom was the first to see this phenomenon. He elbowed Alfred Zittner, who looked, gaped, and then elbowed Harold Gardner. Within a space of seconds, the sandbagging operation stopped. The men lining both sides of the canal only stood and stared toward downtown in the pouring rain, their faces stamped with identical expressions of horrified wonder. Squires, souvenirs, and sundries appeared to have been built on some huge elevator which was now on the way down. It sank into the apparently solid concrete with ponderous stately dignity. When it came to a stop, you could have dropped to your hands and knees on the flooded sidewalk and entered through one of the third floor windows. Water sprayed up all around the building, and a moment later Shorty himself appeared on the roof, waving his arms madly for rescue. Then he was obliterated as the office building next door, the one which housed Mr. Paperback at ground level, also sank into the ground. Unfortunately, this one did not go straight down as Shorty's building had done. The Mr. Paperback building developed a marked lean. For a moment, in fact, it bore a strong resemblance to that fucked-up tower in Pisa, the one on the macaroni boxes. As it tilted, bricks began to shower from its top and sides. Shorty was struck by several. Harold Gardner saw him reel backward, hands to his head, and then the top three floors of the Mr. Paperback building slid off as neatly as pancakes from the top of a stack. Shorty disappeared. Someone on the sandbag line screamed, and then everything was lost in the grinding roar of destruction. Men were knocked off their feet or sent wobbling and staggering back from the canal. Harold Gardner saw the buildings which faced each other across Main Street lean forward, like ladies kibitzing over a card game, their heads almost touching. The street itself was sinking, cracking, breaking up. Water splashed and sprayed. And then, one after another, buildings on both sides of the street simply swayed past their centers of gravity and crashed into the street. The Northeast Bank, the Shoe Boat, Alvy's Smokes and Jokes, Bailey's Lunch, Bandler's Record and Music Barn. Except that by then, there was really no street for them to crash into. The street had fallen into the canal, stretching like taffy at first, and then breaking up into bobbing chunks of asphalt. Harold saw the traffic island at the three-street intersection suddenly drop out of sight, and as water geysered up, he suddenly understood what was going to happen. Gotta get out of here, he screamed at Al Zittner. It's gonna backwater! Al! It's gonna backwater! Al Zittner gave no sign that he had heard. His was the face of a sleepwalker, or perhaps of a man who has been deeply hypnotized. He stood in his soaked red and blue checked sport coat, in his open-collared Lacoste shirt with the little alligator on the left boob, in his blue socks with the crossed white golf clubs knitted into their sides, in his brown L.L. Beans boat shoes with the rubber soles. He was watching perhaps a million dollars of his own personal investments sinking into the street, three or four millions of his friends' investments, the guys he played poker with, the guys he golfed with, the guys he skied with at his time-sharing condo in Rangeley. Suddenly, his hometown, Derry, Maine, for Christ's sake, looked bizarrely like that fucked-up city where the wogs pushed people around in those long, skinny canoes. Water roiled and boiled between the buildings that were still standing. Canal Street ended in a jagged black diving board over the edge of a churning lake. It was really no wonder Zittner hadn't heard Harold. Others, however, had come to the same conclusion Gardner had come to. You couldn't drop that much shit into a raging body of water without causing a lot of trouble. Some dropped the sandbags they had been holding and took to their heels. Harold Gardner was one of these, and so he lived. Others were not so lucky, and were still somewhere in the general area as the canal, its throat now choked with tons of asphalt, concrete, brick, 
plaster, glass, and about $4 million worth of assorted merchandise, back surged and poured over its concrete sleeve, carrying away men and sandbags impartially. Harold kept thinking it meant to have him. No matter how fast he ran, the water kept gaining. He finally escaped by clawing his way up a steep embankment covered with shrubbery. He looked back once and saw a man he believed to be Roger Leonard, the head loan officer at Harold's credit union, trying to start his car in the parking lot of the canal mini mall. Even over the roar of the water and the bellowing wind, Harold could hear the K-car's little sewing machine engine cranking and cranking and cranking as smooth black water ran rocker panel high on both sides of it. Then, with a deep, thundering cry, the Kanduskeeg poured out of its banks and swept both the canal mini mall and Roger Leonard's bright red K-car away. Harold began climbing again, grabbing onto branches, roots, anything that looked solid enough to take his weight. Higher ground, that was the ticket. As Andrew Keene might have said, Harold Gardner was really into the concept of higher ground that morning. Behind him, he could hear downtown Derry continuing to collapse. The sound was like artillery fire. Four. Bill. Beverly! He shouted. His back and arms were one solid, throbbing ache. Richie now seemed to weigh at least 500 pounds. Put him down then, his mind whispered. He's dead. You know damn well he is, so why don't you just put him down? But he wouldn't, couldn't do that. Beverly! He shouted again. Ben! Anyone? He thought, this is where it threw me and Richie. Except it threw us farther, so much farther. What was that like? I'm losing it, forgetting. Bill. It was Ben's voice, shaky and exhausted, somewhere fairly close. Where are you? Over here, man. I've got Richie. He got... He's hurt. Keep talking. Ben was closer now. Keep talking, Bill. We killed it, Bill said, walking toward where Ben's voice had come from. We killed the bitch. And if Richie's dead... Dead! Ben called, alarmed. He was very close now, and then his hand groped out of the dark and pawed lightly at Bill's nose. Who do you mean, dead? I, he. They were supporting Richie together now. I can't see him, Bill said. That's the thing. I c can't see him. Richie, Ben shouted and shook him. Richie, come on. Come on, goddammit. Ben's voice was blurring now, becoming shaky. Richie. Will you wake the fuck up? And in the dark, Richie said in a sleepy, irritable, just coming out of it voice, All right, Haystack, all right. We don't need no stinking batches. Richie! Bill screamed. Richie, are you all right? Bitch threw me, Richie muttered in that same tired, just coming out of sleep voice. I hit something hard. That's all, all I remember. Where's Bevy? Back this way, Ben said. Quickly, he told them about the eggs. I stamped over a hundred. I think I got all of them. I pray to God you did, Richie said. He was starting to sound better. Put me down, Big Bill. I can walk. Is the water louder? Yes, Bill said. The three of them were holding hands in the dark. How's your head? It hurts like hell. What happened after I got knocked out? Bill told them as much as he could bring himself to tell. And it's dead, Richie marveled. Are you sure, Bill? Yes, Bill said. This time I'm really sh sure. Thank God, Richie said. Hold on to me, Bill. I got a barf. Bill did. And when Richie was done, they walked on. Every now and then his foot struck something brittle that rolled off into the darkness, Parts of the spider's eggs that Ben had trumped to pieces, he supposed, and shivered. It was good to know they were going in the right direction, but he was still glad he couldn't see the remains. Beverly! Ben shouted. Beverly! Here! Her cry was faint, almost lost in the steady rumble of the water. They moved forward in the dark, calling to her steadily, zeroing in. When they finally reached her, Bill asked if she had any matches left. 
She put half a pack in his hand. He lit one and saw their faces spring into ghostly being, Ben with his arm around Richie, who was standing slumped, blood running from his right temple, Beverly with Eddie's head in her lap. Then he turned the other way. Audra was lying crumpled on the flagstones, her legs a sprawl, her head turned away. The webbing had mostly melted off her. The match burned his fingers and he let it drop. In the darkness, he misjudged the distance, tripped over her, and nearly went sprawling. Audra, Audra, can you he hear me? He got an arm under her back and sat her up. He slipped a hand under the sheaf of her hair and pressed his fingers against the side of her neck. Her pulse was there, a slow, steady beat. He lit another match, and as it flared, he saw her pupils contract. But that was an involuntary function. The fix of her gaze did not change. Even when he brought the match close enough to her face to redden her skin, she was alive, but unresponsive. Hell, it was worse than that, and he knew it. She was catatonic. The second match burned his fingers. He shook it out. Bill, I don't like the sound of that water, Ben said. I think we ought to get out of here. How will we do it without Eddie? Richie murmured. We can do it, Bev said. Bill, Ben's right. We have to get out. I'm taking her, of course. But we ought to go now. Which way? You'll know, Beverly said softly. You killed it. You'll know, Bill. He picked Audra up as he had picked Richie up and went back to the others. The feel of her in his arms was disquieting, creepy. She was like a breathing waxwork. Which way, Bill? Ben asked. I don't. You'll know. You killed it and you'll know. Well, c come on, Bill said. Let's see if we can't find out. Beverly, g grab these. He handed her the matches. What about Eddie? She asked. We have to take him out. How can we, Bill asked. It's Beverly. The place is falling apart. We gotta get him out of here, man, Richie said. Come on, Ben. Between them, they managed to hoist up Eddie's body. Beverly lit them back to the fairy tale door. Bill took Audra through it, holding her up from the floor as best he could. Richie and Ben carried Eddie through. Put him down, Beverly said. He can stay here. It's too dark, Richie sobbed. You know, it's too dark. Ed's, he- No, it's okay, Ben said. Maybe this is where he's supposed to be. I think maybe it is. They put him down, and Richie kissed Eddie's cheek. Then he looked blindly up at Ben. You sure? Yeah. Come on, Richie. Richie got up and turned toward the door. Fuck you, bitch, he cried suddenly and kicked the door shut with his foot. It made a solid chucking sound as it closed and latched. Why'd you do that? Beverly asked. I don't know, Richie said, but he knew well enough. He looked back over his shoulder just as the match Beverly was holding went out. Bill, the mark on the door. What about it? Bill panted. Richie said, it's gone. Five. Derry, 10.30 a.m. The glass corridor connecting the adult library to the children's library suddenly exploded in a single brilliant flare of light. Glass flew out in an umbrella shape, wickering through the straining, whipping trees which dotted the library grounds. Someone could have been severely hurt or even killed by such a deadly fusillade. But there was no one there, either inside or out. The library had not been opened that day at all. The tunnel which had so fascinated Ben Hanscom as a boy would never be replaced. There had been so much costly destruction in Derry that it seemed simpler to leave the two libraries as separate, unconnected buildings. In time, no one on the Derry City Council could even remember what that glass umbilicus had been for. Perhaps only Ben himself could really have told them how it was to stand outside in the still cold of a January night, your nose running, the tips of your fingers numb inside your mittens, watching the people pass back and forth inside, walking through winter with their coats off and surrounded by light. He could have told them, but maybe it wasn't the sort of thing you could have gotten up and testified about at a city council meeting, how you stood out in the cold dark and learned to love the light. All of that's as may be, 
The facts were just these. The glass corridor blew up for no apparent reason. No one was hurt, which was a blessing, since the final toll taken by that morning storm, in human terms at least, was 67 killed and better than 320 injured. And it was never rebuilt. After May 31st of 1985, if you wanted to get from the children's library to the adult library, you had to walk outside to do it. And if it was cold or raining or snowing, you had to put on your coat. 6. Out. 10.54 a.m., May 31st, 1985. Wait, Bill gasped. Give me a chance. Rest. Let me help you with her, Richie said again. They had left Eddie back in the spider's lair, and that was something none of them wanted to talk about. But Eddie was dead, and Audra was still alive, at least technically. I'll do it, Bill said between choked gasps for air. Bullshit. You'll give yourself a fucking heart attack. Let me help you, Big Bill. How's your head? Hurts, Richie said. Don't change the subject. Reluctantly, Bill let Richie take her. It could have been worse. Audra was a tall girl whose normal weight was 140 pounds. But the part she'd been scheduled to play in Attic Room was that of a young woman being held hostage by a borderline psychotic who fancied himself a political terrorist. Because Freddie Firestone had wanted to shoot all of the attic sequences first, Audra had gone on a strict poultry cottage cheese tuna fish diet and lost 20 pounds. Still, after Stumble staggering along with her in the dark for a quarter of a mile, or a half, or three quarters of a mile, or who knew, that 120 felt more like 200. Thanks, man, he said. Don't mention it. Your turn next, Haystack. Beep, beep, Richie, Ben said, and Bill grinned in spite of himself. It was a tired grin, and it didn't last long, but a little was better than none. Which way, Bill? Beverly asked. That water sounds louder than ever. I don't really fancy drowning down here. Straight ahead, then left, Bill said. Maybe we better try to go a little faster. They went on for half an hour, Bill calling the lefts and rights. The sound of the water continued to swell until it seemed to surround them, a scary Dolby stereo effect in the dark. Bill felt his way around a corner, one hand trailing over damp brick, and suddenly water was running over his shoes. The current was shallow and fast. Give me Audra, he said to Ben, who was panting loudly. Upstream now. Ben passed her carefully back to Bill, who managed to sling her over his shoulder in a fireman's carry. If she'd only protest, move, do something. How's matches, Bev? Not many. Half a dozen, maybe? Bill, do you know where you're going? I think I do, he said. Come on. They followed him around the corner. The water foamed about Bill's ankles. Then it was up to his shins, and then it was thigh deep. The thunder of the water had deepened to a steady bass roar. The tunnel they were in was shaking steadily. For a while, Bill thought the current was going to become too strong to walk against, but then they passed a feeder pipe that was pouring a huge jet of water into their tunnel. He marveled at the white water force of it, and the current slacked off somewhat, although the water continued to deepen. It... I saw the water coming out of that feeder pipe. Saw it. Hey! He shouted. Can you guys see anything? It's been getting lighter for the last 15 minutes or so, Beverly shouted back. Where are we, Bill? Do you know? I thought I did, Bill almost said. No! Come on! He had believed they must be approaching the concrete channeled section of the Kanduski that was called the canal. The part that went under downtown and came out in Bassey Park. But there was light down here. Light. And surely there could be no light in the canal under the city. But it brightened steadily just the same. Bill was beginning to have serious problems with Audra. It wasn't the current. That had slackened. It was the depth. Pretty soon I'll be floating her, he thought. He could see Ben on his left and Beverly on his right. By turning his head slightly, he could see Richie behind Ben. The footing was getting decidedly odd. The bottom of the tunnel was now heaped and mounded with detritus, bricks, it felt like. And up ahead, something was sticking out of the water like the prow of a ship that is in the process of sinking. Ben floundered toward it, shivering in the cold water. A soggy cigar box floated into his face. 
He pushed it aside and grabbed at the thing sticking out of the water. His eyes widened. It appeared to be a large sign. He was able to read the letters, Al, and below that, Fut. And suddenly, he knew. Bill! Richie! Bev! He was laughing with astonishment. What is it, Ben? Beverly shouted. Grabbing it with both hands, Ben rocked it back. There was a grating sound as one side of the sign scraped along the wall of the tunnel. Now they could read, Aladdin, And below that, back to the future. It's the marquee for the Aladdin, Richie said. How? The street caved in, Bill whispered. His eyes were widening. He stared up the tunnel. The light was brighter still up ahead. What, Bill? What the fuck happened? Bill, Bill, what? All these drains, Bill said wildly. All these old drains. There's been another flood. And I think this time, he began to flounder ahead again, holding Audra up. Ben, Bev, and Richie fell in behind him. Five minutes later, Bill looked up and saw a blue sky. He was looking through a crack in the ceiling of the tunnel, a crack that widened to better than 70 feet across as it ran away from where he stood. The water was broken by many islands and archipelagos up ahead, piles of bricks, the back deck of a Plymouth sedan with its trunk sprung open and pouring water, a parking meter leaning against the tunnel wall at a drunken slant, its red violation flag up. The footing had become almost impossible now. Many mountains that rose and fell with no rhyme or reason, inviting a broken ankle. The water ran mildly around their armpits. Mild now, Bill thought. But if we'd been here two hours ago, even one, I think we might have gotten the ride of our lives. What the fuck is this, Big Bill? Richie asked. He was standing at Bill's left elbow, his face soft with wonder as he looked up at the rip in the roof of the tunnel. Except it's not the roof of any tunnel, Bill thought. It's Main Street. At least it used to be. I think most of downtown Derry is now in the canal and being carried down the Kandusky River. Pretty soon it'll be in the Penobscot, and then it will be in the Atlantic Ocean and good fucking riddance. Can you help me with Audra, Richie? I, I don't think I can. Sure, Richie said. Sure, Bill. No sweat. He took Audra from Bill. In this light, Bill could see her better than he perhaps wanted to. Her pallor masked but not hidden by the dirt and ordure that smeared her forehead and caked her cheeks. Her eyes were still wide open, wide open and innocent of all sense. Her hair hung lank and wet. She might as well have been one of those inflatable dollies they sold at the pleasure chest in New York or along the Reeperbahn in Hamburg. The only difference was her slow, steady respiration. And that might have been a clockwork trick, no more than that. How are we going to get up from here? He asked Richie. Get Ben to give you ten fingers, Richie said. You can yank Bev up, and the two of you can get your wife. Ben can boost me, and we'll get Ben. And after that, I'll show you how to set up a volleyball tournament for a thousand sorority girls. Beep, beep, Richie. Beep, beep your ass, Big Bill. The tiredness was going through him in steady waves. He caught Beverly's level gaze and held it for a moment. She nodded to him slightly, and he made a smile for her. Give me ten fingers, b Ben. Ben, who also looked unutterably weary, nodded. A deep scratch ran down one cheek. I think I can handle that. He stooped slightly and laced his hands together. Bill hiked one foot, stepped into Ben's hand, and jumped up. It wasn't quite enough. Ben lifted the step he had made with his hands, and Bill grabbed the edge of the broken-in tunnel roof. He yanked himself up. The first thing he saw was a white and orange crash barrier. The second thing was a crowd of milling men and women beyond the barrier. The third was Freeze's department store, only it had an oddly bulged out foreshortened look. It took him a moment to realize that almost half of Freeze's had sunk into the street and the canal beneath. The top half had slewed out over the street and seemed in danger of toppling over like a pile of badly stacked books. Look! Look, there's someone in the street! A woman was pointing toward the place where Bill's head had poked out of the crevasse in the shattered pavement. Praise God, there's someone else. She started forward, an elderly woman with a kerchief tied over her head, peasant style. A cop held her back. Not safe out there, Mrs. Nelson, you know it. Rest of the street might go any time. Mrs. Nelson, Bill thought. I remember you. 
Your sister used to sit George and me sometimes. He raised his hand to show her he was all right, and when she raised her own hand in return, he felt a sudden surge of good feelings and hope. He turned around and lay flat on the sagging pavement, trying to distribute his weight as evenly as possible, the way you were supposed to do on thin ice. He reached down for Bev. She grasped his wrists and, with what seemed to be the last of his strength, he pulled her up. The sun, which had disappeared again, now ran out from behind a brace of mackerel-scale clouds and gave them their shadows back. Beverly looked up, startled, caught Bill's eyes, and smiled. I love you, Bill, she said, and I pray she'll be all right. Thank you, Bevy, he said, and his kind smile made her start to cry a little. He hugged her, and the small crowd gathered behind the crash barrier applauded. A photographer from the Derry News snapped a picture. It appeared in the June 1st edition of the paper, which was printed in Bangor because of water damage to the news's presses. The caption was simple enough and true enough for Bill to cut the picture out and keep it tucked away in his wallet for years to come. Survivors, the caption read. That was all, but that was enough. It was six minutes of eleven in Derry, Maine. Seven. Derry, later the same day. The glass corridor between the children's library and the adult library had exploded at 10.30 a.m. At 10.33, the rain stopped. It didn't taper off. It stopped all at once, as if someone up there had flicked a toggle switch. The wind had already begun to fall, and it fell so rapidly that people stared at each other with uneasy, superstitious faces. The sound was like the wind-down of a 747's engines after it has been safely parked at the gate. The sun peeked out for the first time at 1047. By mid-afternoon, the clouds had burned away entirely, and the day had come off fair and hot. By 3.30 p.m., the mercury in the orange crush thermometer outside the door of second-hand rose, second-hand clothes, read 83, the highest reading of the young season. People walked through the streets like zombies, not talking much. Their expressions were remarkably similar, a kind of stupid wonder that would have been funny if it was not also so frankly pitiable. By evening, reporters from ABC, CBS, NBC, and CNN had arrived in Derry, and the network news reporters would bring some version of the truth home to most people. They would make it real, although there were those who might have suggested that reality is a highly untrustworthy concept, something perhaps no more solid than a piece of canvas stretched over an interlacing of cables, like the strands of a spider web. The following morning, Bryant Gumbel and Willard Scott of the Today Show would be in Derry. During the course of the program, Gumbel would interview Andrew Keene. Whole standpipe just crashed over and rolled down the hill, Andrew said. It was like, wow, you know what I mean? Like Steven Spielberg, eat your heart out, you know? Hey, I always got the idea, looking at you on TV, that you were, you know, a lot bigger. Seeing themselves and their neighbors on TV, that would make it real. It would give them a place from which to grasp this terrible, ungraspable thing. It had been a freak storm. In the days following, the death count would rise in the wake of the killer storm. It was, in fact, the worst spring storm in Maine history. All of these headlines, as terrible as they were, were useful. They helped to blunt the essential strangeness of what had happened. Or perhaps strangeness was too mild a word. Insanity might have been better. Seeing themselves on TV would help make it concrete, less insane. But in the hours before the news crews arrived, there were only the people from Derry, walking through their rubble-strewn, mud-slicked streets with expressions of stunned unbelief on their faces. Only the people from Derry, not talking much, looking at things, occasionally picking things up and then tossing them down again, trying to figure out what had happened during the last seven or eight hours. Men stood on Kansas Street, smoking, looking at houses lying upside down in the barrens. Other men and women stood beyond the white and orange crash barriers, looking into the black hole that had been downtown until ten that morning. The headline of that Sunday's paper read, We will rebuild, vows Derry Mayor. And perhaps they would. But in the weeks that followed, 
While the city council wrangled over how the rebuilding should begin, the huge crater that had been downtown continued to grow in an unspectacular but steady way. Four days after the storm, the office building of the Bangor Hydroelectric Company collapsed into the hole. Three days after that, the Flying Dog House, which sold the best kraut and chili dogs in eastern Maine, fell in. Drains backed up periodically in houses, apartment buildings, and businesses. It got so bad in the Old Cape that people began to leave. June 10th was the first evening of horse racing at Bassey Park. The first pace was scheduled for 8 p.m., and that seemed to cheer everyone up. But a section of bleachers collapsed as the trotters in the first race turned into the home stretch, and half a dozen people were hurt. One of them was Foxy Foxworth, who had managed the Aladdin Theater until 1973. Foxy spent two weeks in the hospital, suffering from a broken leg and a punctured testicle. When he was released, he decided to go to his sister's in Summersworth, New Hampshire. He wasn't the only one. Derry was falling apart. Eight. They watched the orderly slam the back doors of the ambulance and go around to the passenger seat. The ambulance started up the hill toward the Derry Home Hospital. Richie had flagged it down at severe risk of life and limb and had argued the irate driver to a draw when the driver insisted he just didn't have any more room. He had ended up stretching Audra out on the floor. Now what? Ben asked. There were huge brown circles under his eyes and a grimy ring of dirt around his neck. I'm going back to the townhouse, Bill said. G gonna sleep for about 16 hours. I second that, Richie said. He looked hopefully at Bev. Got any cigarettes, pretty lady? No, Beverly said. I think I'm going to quit again. Sensible enough idea. They began to walk slowly up the hill, the four of them side by side. It's over, Bill said. Ben nodded. We did it. You did it, Big Bill. We all did it, Beverly said. I wish we could have brought Eddie up. I wish that more than anything. They reached the corner of Upper Main and Point Street. A kid in a red rain slicker and green rubber boots was sailing a paper boat along the brisk run of water in the gutter. He looked up, saw them looking at him, and waved tentatively. Bill thought it was the boy with the skateboard, the one whose friend had seen Jaws in the canal. He smiled and stepped toward the boy. It's all right now, he said. The boy studied him gravely and then grinned. The smile was sunny and hopeful. Yeah, he said. I think it is. Bet your uh, ass. The kid laughed. You gonna be careful on that skateboard? Not really, the kid said. And this time Bill laughed. He restrained an urge to ruffle the kid's hair. That probably would have been resented and returned to the others. Who is that? Richie asked. A friend, Bill said. He stuffed his hands in his pockets. Do you remember it? When we came out before? Beverly nodded. Eddie got us back to the Barrens. Only we ended up on the other side of the Kandusky somehow, the old Cape side. You and Haystack pushed the lid off one of those pumping stations, Richie said to Bill, because you had the most weight. Yeah, Ben said, we did. The sun was out, but it was almost down. Yeah, Bill said. And we were all there. But nothing lasts forever, Richie said. He looked back down the hill they had just climbed and sighed. Look at this, for instance. He held his hands out. The tiny scars in the palms were gone. Beverly put her hands out. Ben did the same. Bill added his. All were dirty, but unmarked. Nothing lasts forever, Richie repeated. He looked up at Bill, and Bill saw tears cut slowly through the dirt on Richie's cheeks. Except maybe for love, Ben said. And desire, Beverly said. How about friends, Bill asked and smiled. What do you think, trash mouth? Well, Richie said, smiling and rubbing his eyes. I gotta think about it, boy. I say, I say, I got to think about it. Bill put his hands out, and they joined theirs with his, and stood there for a moment, seven, who had been reduced to four, but who could still make a circle. They looked at each other. Ben was crying now, too, the tears spilling from his eyes, but he was smiling. I love you guys so much, he said. 
He squeezed Bev's and Richie's hands tight, tight, tight for a moment, and then dropped them. Now, could we see if they've got such a thing as breakfast in this place? And we ought to call Mike, tell him we're okay. Good thinning, senor, Richie said. Every now and then, I think you might turn out okay. What you think, Big Bill? I think you ought to go fuck yourself, Bill said. They walked into the townhouse on a wave of laughter, and as Bill pushed through the glass door, Beverly caught sight of something which she never spoke of, but never forgot. For just a moment she saw their reflections in the glass, only there were six, not four, because Eddie was behind Richie, and Stan was behind Bill, that little half-smile on his face. Nine. Out. Dusk, August 10th, 1958. The sun sits neatly on the horizon, a slightly oblate red ball that throws a flat, feverish light over the barrens. The iron cover on top of one of the pumping stations rises a little, settles, rises again, and begins to slide. Push it, Ben! It's breaking my shoulder! The cover slides farther, tilts, and falls into the shrubbery that has grown up around the concrete cylinder. Seven children come out one by one and look around, blinking owlishly in silent wonder. They are like children who have never seen daylight before. It's so quiet, Beverly says softly. The only sounds are the loud rush of water and the somnolent hum of insects. The storm is over, but the Kanduskeeg is still very high. Closer to town, not far from the place where the river is corseted in concrete and called a canal, it has overflowed its banks, although the flooding is by no means serious, a few wet cellars is the worst of it. This time. Stan moves away from them, his face blank and thoughtful. Bill looks around, and at first he thinks Stan has seen a small fire on the riverbank. Fire is his first impression, a red glow almost too bright to look at. But when Stan picks the fire up in his right hand, the angle of the light changes, and Bill sees it's nothing but a Coke bottle, one of the new clear ones which someone has dropped by the river. He watches as Stan reverses it, holds it by the neck, and brings it down on a shelf of rock jutting out of the bank. The bottle breaks, and Bill is aware they are all watching Stan now as he pokes through the shattered remains of the bottle, his face sober and studious and absorbed. At last he picks up a narrow wedge of glass. The westering sun throws red glints from it, and Bill thinks again, like a fire. Stan looks up at him, and Bill suddenly understands. It is perfectly clear to him and perfectly right. He steps forward toward Stan with his hands held out, palms up. Stan backs away into the water. Small black bugs stitch along just above the surface, and Bill can see an iridescent dragonfly go buzzing off into the reeds along the far bank like a small flying rainbow. A frog begins a steady bass thud, and as Stan takes his left hand and draws the edge of glass down his palm, peeling skin and bringing thin blood, Bill thinks in a kind of ecstasy, there's so much life down here. Bill? Sure, both. Stan cuts his other hand. There is pain, but not much. A whippoorwill has begun to call somewhere, a cool sound, peaceful. Bill thinks... That whippoorwill is raising the moon. He looks at his hands, both of them bleeding now, and then around him. The others are there, Eddie with his aspirator clutched tightly in one hand, Ben with his big belly pushing palely out through the tattered remains of his shirt, Richie, his face oddly naked without his glasses, Mike, silent and solemn, his normally full lips compressed to a thin line, and Beverly, her head up, her eyes wide and clear, her hair still somehow lovely in spite of the dirt that mats it. All of us. All of us are here. And he sees them, really sees them for the last time, because in some way he understands that they will never all be together again, the seven of them, not this way. No one talks. Beverly holds out her hands, and after a moment Richie and Ben hold out theirs. Mike and Eddie do the same. Stan cuts them one by one as the sun begins to slip behind the horizon, cooling that red furnace glow to a dusky rose pink. The whippoorwill cries again, 
Bill can see the first faint swirls of mist on the water, and he feels as if he's become a part of everything. This is a brief ecstasy, which he will no more talk about than Beverly will later talk about the brief reflection she sees of two dead men who were, as boys, her friends. A breeze touches the trees and bushes, making them sigh, and he thinks, this is a lovely place and I'll never forget it. It's lovely, and they are lovely. Each one of them is gorgeous. The whippoorwill cries again, sweet and liquid, and for a moment Bill feels at one with it, as if he could sing and then be gone into the dusk, as if he could fly away, brave in the air. He looks at Beverly, and she's smiling at him. She closes her eyes and holds her hands out to either side. Bill takes her left, Ben her right. Bill can feel the warmth of her blood mixing with his own. The others join in, and they stand in a circle, all of their hands now sealed in that peculiarly intimate way. Stan is looking at Bill with a kind of urgency, a kind of fear. S swear to me that you'll c c come back, Bill says. Swear to me that if it isn't dead, you'll c come back. Swear, Ben said. Swear, Richie. Yes, I swear, Bev. Swear it, Mike Hanlon mutters. Yeah, swear, Eddie, his voice a thin and reedy whisper. I swear too, Stan whispers. But his voice falters and he looks down as he speaks. I s s swear. That was it. That was all. But they stand there for a while longer, feeling the power that is in their circle, the closed body that they make. The light paints their faces in pale, fading colors. The sun is now gone and sunset is dying. They stand together in a circle as the darkness creeps down into the barrens, filling up the paths they have walked this summer, the clearings where they have played tag and guns, the secret places along the riverbanks where they have sat and discussed childhood's long questions or smoked Beverly's cigarettes, or where they have merely been silent, watching the passage of the clouds reflected in the water. The eye of the day is closing. At last, Ben drops his hands. He starts to say something, shakes his head and walks away. Richie follows him, then Beverly and Mike walking together. No one talks. They climb the embankment to Kansas Street and simply take leave of one another. And when Bill thinks it over 27 years later, he realizes that they really never did all get together again. Four of them, quite often, sometimes five, and maybe six once or twice, but never all seven. He's the last to go. He stands for a long time with his hands on the rickety white fence, looking down into the barrens as, overhead, the first stars seed the summer sky. He stands under the blue and over the black and watches the barrens fill up with darkness. I never want to play down there again, he thinks suddenly, and is amazed to find the thought is not terrible or distressing, but tremendously liberating. He stands there a moment longer and then turns away from the barons and starts home, walking along the dark sidewalk with his hands in his pockets, glancing from time to time at the houses of Derry, warmly lit against the night. After a block or two, he begins to walk faster, thinking of supper. And a block or two after that, he begins to whistle. <laughs>